a very good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Sai and the Vietnamese uh, Society for Sleep Medicine for inviting me to give this talk today on the evaluation and management of snoring. All the contents of my presentation today is uh, actually found in my recent publication uh, of the same title in the Elsevier Sleep Medicine Clinics. Snoring is a vibratory noise produced in sleep from cyclical obstruction and reopening of the upper airway, about 50 times per second, arising from the soft palate, pharynx, lateral pharyngeal wall, epiglottis, or tongue base. Solitary palatal fluttering is seen in simple snorers, while palate and lateral pharyngeal wall vibration is seen in mild to moderate OSA. Combined palate and lateral pharyngeal wall or tongue base and epiglottis vibration is usually seen in severe OSA. And snoring in OSA occurs mostly in apnea terminating hyperpneas where turbulence is maximum. As far as snoring and sleep disorder breathing is concerned, snoring indicates a five times increased risk of OSA. It's been reported in 38% of men and 30% of women in a huge, uh, large UK survey. Pauses in breathing is also reported in 8.7% of men and 5.6% of women. And regular snoring is associated with a decrease, sorry, an increased risk of coronary heart disease and also stroke. Primary snoring is not associated with sleepiness or medical hazards. However, secondary snoring is symptomatic of sleep disordered breathing, which is a spectrum from upper airway resistance syndrome to mild, moderate, and severe OSA. 9% to 38% of adults more than 18 years old have OSA, and multiple systemic chronic illnesses are associated with sleep disordered breathing. Polysomnographic classification of mild, moderate, and severe OSA based on AHI is, does not actually correlate well with quality of life or the comorbidities of sleep disordered breathing. And in fact, PSG does not guide treatment or predict outcome in the heterogeneous problem. So we need to look at the phenotypes of SDB, of sleep disordered breathing, in order to understand how to best manage them and to have very personalized and precise uh, management uh, algorithms or strategies. So the broad phenotyping includes anatomic and non-anatomic factors. And patients do not always fit neatly into these categories. And often multiple, multiple factors are present and their dynamic interrelationship needs to be adequately appreciated to strategize the timing and the type of therapy. These anatomic and non-anatomic subtypes are upper airway obstruction, pharyngeal dilator function, increased loop gain, or a low arousal threshold. So you can see from this schematic, a narrow upper airway, low arousal thresholds, high loop gain, or poor muscle or dilator function. In a more complex slide, uh, this looks at all the anatomic as well as the non-anatomic uh, factors that interplay in every patient. So you can see that it is in fact uh, very complicated and yet uh, challenging for us as uh, sleep physicians or surgeons to fully understand our patients and therefore to strategize management specific to their needs and to their problem. Let me first address the anatomic factors. So you can see from this uh, table here, the anatomic framework for sleep disorder breathing includes the nasal airway complex and the pharyngeal airway. And we should also think of it in terms of a skeletal container and soft tissue contents. So the upper airway consists of this container with soft tissue contents divided into the nasal airway complex and the pharynx. Cephalometric analysis in patients with OSA show increased lower anterior facial height and vertical growth pattern, giving them a long and narrow face, as well as an inferior position of the higher bone, decreased pharyngeal airway space, decreased length of the cranial base and cranial base angle, relatively smaller maxilla and mandible, retropositioned mandibles, and also increased length, thickness, and surface area of the soft palate. Decreased lower anterior facial height is also predictive of severe OSA, while retronethia is much more common in severe OSA than in snorers. A clockwise rotation and shorter mandibles are also associated with OSA. Looking at the nasal airway complex, 
it in fact contributes more than 50% of airway resistance, with the greatest resistance being at the internal and external nasal valves. Nasal obstruction worsens the respiratory disturbance index, OSS severity, and impairs sleep quality in allergic and non-allergic rhinitis patients. An acute maxillary angle or a narrow maxillary width with a high arch palate are skeletal characteristics associated with persistent nasal obstruction that in fact contributes to sleep disordered breathing. 85% of patients with OSA with nasal obstruction has septal deviation or inferior turbinate hypertrophy. And inferior turbinate hypertrophy is found in 93 to 97% of snorers and OSA. The pharynx of patients with OSA is narrower, rounder, and versus a more oval one, and it's also more collapsible and must expand more to facilitate airflow. A large tongue, macroglossia, hypertrophic adenoids and tonsils, thickening of the lateral pharyngeal wall also crowds the airway further. This is usually because of obesity, inflammation, or increased vascular volume. The presence of tongue scalloping right, is also strongly predictive of abnormal AHI and nocturnal hypoxia. And this is caused by a large tongue, a small mandible, or a high arch palate, so where the, the tongue has no space to fit in the mouth. And that actually creates a narrower pharyngeal airway. A short lingual frenulum or tongue tie at birth also leads to OSA and sleep disturbance. And in fact, it's been shown to be associated with five times increased risk of OSA in children aged 3 to 17 due to narrowing of the maxillary arch and elongation of the soft palate. This is a result of loss of tongue palate coupling, which is actually a necessary stimulus for maxillary growth. Looking now at the dynamic abnormalities or factors, an expiratory collapse occurs when constricting forces overwhelm the expanding forces of pharyngeal dilators. And so this imbalance increases the critical closing pressure or known as P-crit, which is a more positive pre-crit, indicating a more collapsible airway. P-crit is increased by a larger neck circumference, soft palate length, and higher mental distance. And reduced an expiratory lung volume in the obese also increases P-crit and therefore aggravates OSA. The pharyngeal dilator function is also very important where we feel there's an altered neuromuscular function and reflexes of the pharyngeal dilators. These are seen in OSA. And in fact, the genioglossus demonstrates lower tonic activity and increased phasic activation in response to apnea. Neuromuscular responses are also deranged and in response to hypoxia, reduced airway diameter and airway pressure, these Neuromuscular responses fatigue by as much as 50% in OSA, and protective reflexes are impaired as well. On the area of high loop gain, what it is, is it is an exaggerated ventilatory response to CO2 changes. And a third of patients with OSA have high loop gain, where there's a more than five liters per minute increase in minute volume. Uh, it's seen in response to a one liter per minute reduction in minute volume. So this creates a hypoventilation, hyperventilation cycle, respiratory instability, and increased apnea. Arousal threshold may also be reduced in patients with OSA, whereby sudden arousals augment pharyngeal dilator muscle activity to reopen the airway. So the hyperventilatory responses drive down CO2 below the chemical apnea threshold, resulting in central apnea. Hypocapnia also impairs the dilator function by decreasing neural output. A low arousal threshold right, can be predicted by this clinical score, where one point is given if the AHI is more than 30, one point if the saturation, lower saturation is more than 82.5%, and the frequency of hypopnea is more than 58%. If a score if is more than two, it in fact predicts a low arousal threshold. Mouth breathing syndrome is a new term coined recently by the Brazilians. And in fact, it's a very good way to tie up uh, sleep disordered breathing symptoms and signs in children, as well as their causes and complications. It is a red flag for sleep disordered breathing. It should alert us to the presence of nose block, nasal obstruction from allergic rhinitis, enlarged adenoids and enlarged tonsils, as well as sometimes deviation of the nasal septum. So in children, this in fact starts the progression 
towards sleep disorder breathing. Airway resistance is in fact increased in obstructive apneas, hypopneas as well are increased in oral breathing versus nasal breathing during sleep. And this is explained by the reduced pharyngeal diameter, shortening of the pharyngeal dilators and impaired dilator functions in mouth when they have mouth breathing. So I've created this uh, flowchart to tie up all the possible causes of mouth breathing, which include allergic rhinitis, hypertrophic adenoids and tonsils, and a short lingual frenulum and chyloglossia. And mouth breathing syndrome alone can give you sleep disordered breathing. Mouth breathing also increases the morbidities of asthma, uh, cognitive dysfunction, craniofacial and dental changes, growth changes in the nose as well, and postural changes, which I will show you in a minute. So mouth breathing syndrome was in fact reported in 17% of the population of Nagahama City, in this large uh, study. And in fact, they also showed worsening of asthma by 85% for those who just mouth breathe alone. If they have allergic rhinitis alone, their worsening of asthma is 2.2 times. But when they have mouth breathing and allergic rhinitis together, their asthma worsened by four times. A systematic review of mouth breathers in Brazil showed increased smell occlusion with angle class two division one more than class one. Postural changes such as forward head position, higher head projection, shoulder asymmetry are also seen in mouth breathers. And so this is what I mean by the craniofacial dental changes, the class two male occlusion, and the crooked teeth, narrow face, and smaller airways with a setback jaw with the retronathia. So you will see these longer faces, retronatic maxilla, obtuse gonial angles, deep narrow palatal arches, and male occlusions where class two is the most common. We also see often see cross bite. Postural changes in mouth breathers include all these, like forward head projection, shoulder asymmetry, scapular elevation, and so on. And so they're quite easy to spot when these children come into our clinics. So evaluation of the snoring patient, understanding all the anatomic and dynamic factors, must then aim to evaluate these phenotypes. Are they anatomic or non-anatomic? And are they both? And what are their interrelationships? We need to grade the severity of the disorder and establish baseline for intervention as well as guide treatment options. And this systematic evaluation should proceed as follows. We need to get a good sleep health history, study their comorbidities, right, to rule out uh, risks as well as complications from their sleep disorder breathing and do a systematic examination. So sleep health history, right, should include studying their snoring habits, the timeline and periodicity, its association with drugs or alcohol, its association with body position, gasping, choking, and witness apneas. Then we should also look at underlying airway disorders, such as rhinitis, tonsillitis, and other respiratory diseases. Sleep quality must also be studied. Do they have insomnia, nocturnal awakenings, daytime sleepiness, inattention, reduction in work or school performance, all indicating the impact of their snoring and sleep disorder breathing. I'd like to highlight here uh, how important it is to pick this up in children early where we can still treat them and reverse their progression to adult SDP. Often these children with uh, disturbed breathing have hyperactive behavior, bedwetting, night terrors, bruxism, which is uh, uh, grinding of the teeth, inattention, sleepiness, snoring, and mouth breathing. So let's look for all these things in children. And when we look for them in adults, we should also include early morning headaches, loss of libido, mood changes, erectile dysfunction, and also nocturia. Thinking of their comorbidities to see the impact on their overall health, right? hypertension is a must uh, look for, and the increased risk of systemic hypertension is 37%, you know, with an AHI of 30, and 24% in twofold increase, uh, and a twofold increase in rapid eye movement uh, AHI. Cardiovascular problems, relative odds of heart failure about 2.4 and stroke about 1.6 and coronary heart disease 1.3 compared with the highest quartile when you compare the highest quartile versus lowest quartile of AHI. Diabetes mellitus often coexists with OSA 
and hazard ratios of developing diabetes for mild, moderate, and severe OSA are so, and are com compared with a non-OSA population, right? Cognitive decline is often seen in patients with sleep disordered breathing. And in fact, meta-analysis of cohort studies showed increased cognitive impairment or dementia in individuals with sleep disordered breathing. A systematic examination must look at their obesity or BMI, knowing that severe obesity is associated with moderate to uh, severe sleep apnea in 65% of males and 23% of females. Next circumference correlates well with increased soft tissue volume of the tongue and lateral pharyngeal walls. Hypothyroid cranial dysmorphisms must be studied. Hypothyroidism or acromegaly must be ruled out. And finally, a good upper airway examination is important to look for the sites and patterns of obstruction, whether it's skeletal or soft tissue, whether there's overcrowding or collapse of the soft tissue, and whether these obstructions or narrowings are static or dynamic. All right, this is a table showing all the areas of uh, examination, going through from the face to the jaws, oral cavity, nasal airway complex, nasal pharynx, soft palate, tongue, tongue basin epiglottis, lateral pharyngeal wall, and the posture uh, of the patient. I can make this available to you, uh, no problem. I will pass it on to the organizers. Uh, so looking at the inferior terminates, for instance, we should grade the size of the inferior turbinates as so, uh, grade one to grade four, right? Looking at the percentage of the space it occupies. We can assess the soft palate, angle and length, uh, and therefore classify it this way. We can also look at the tongue base and epiglottis and their various classifications, looking at whether they're upper tongue base, lower tongue base, and whether it also involves the epiglottis. So all these are relevant especially if we are going to embark on soft tissue surgery for these patients. Another new classification of tongue time has come out from Audrey Yu, and this is a, a very useful tool I find in looking at uh, short lingual frenulums, where a grade one yeah, is where the tongue tip is able to touch uh, the incisive papilla uh, when the mouth is fully open, or at least more than 80% of the height. And grade two is 50 to 80%, Grade three is less than 50%, and grade four is less than 25%. So these are patients that we will want to target uh, myofunctional therapy on and possibly also uh, phrenotomy or tongue tie release. All right. When we study the faces of children, again, I just want to recap this because it's so important to look at the faces of children to see if they already have changes, uh, craniofacial growth changes. And looking at small chins, Retronatia, steep mandible plane, high arch palate, long oval face, long soft palate, class two male occlusion, or a narrow mandible inter arch distance. The sleep study still remains the gold standard for differentiating snorers from STB and accessing, assessing their severity. A level one fully attended sleep study provides complete information, but it's most is quite inaccessible to most centers or places, and it's difficult and costly to administer. Levels two and three, of course, are cheaper and more comfortable, but offer only limited information. Level four studies are useful only as a screening tool. So we should choose our study based on the types of comorbidities the patient has and how much information uh, we need. Of course, with less information, more clinical assessment is needed, and we should be ready to upgrade to level one studies uh, when, when a level one study to a level one study when we are in doubt of the patient's uh, condition. Imaging can be helpful, especially lateral cephalograms, MRIs and CT scans to assess nasal, the nasal airway complex, the pharyngeal airway, soft tissue bulk of the tongue, tongue base, and peripheral space. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy is often done prior to any surgeries. This is to identify the site and severity of the, of the upper airway obstruction, most common being the votes classification. And in fact, a review of 1,249 patients shows uh, that most of the time there is palatal obstruction or tongue-based obstruction. And 68% of them uh, were multi-level, as shown in this Venn diagram here. Finally, the management of snoring and SDP must be to treat them uh, using different modalities, but targeting the phenotype, right? 
I mean, the, uh, we have various non-pharmacologic, pharmacologic and surgical options. Selection of therapy and timing should be based on their age, whether they are child or adult, pre-pubertal or post, based on their phenotype, their severity, as well as the risk of anesthesia and type of surgery being considered. Right? General managers, measures must include weight loss, good sleep hygiene. The PAP therapy is a conservative measure. Myofunctional therapy is also a conservative uh, treatment, which has shown to be very useful. Surgery can include either soft tissue or skeletal surgery. With that, I thank you very much. And if you liked some of this material or more information, please don't hesitate to contact me in this email here. Thank you very much and have a good evening.